And welcome back to the Try, Fail, Learn podcast, the podcast all about professionals and the lessons they've learned through the years. In today's episode, we have the CMO of Numa Media, Nick Jetta. And hey, I just want to add a little reminder. If you have been listening to this podcast and you're enjoying what you're hearing, please don't forget to leave us a rating and write a review. It really does help us grow the audience. All right, let's get into it. Nick, thanks so much for being on the show, man. If you want to uh, go ahead and give an introduction to yourself. Oh boy, this is always the hardest part about like anytime I speak with somebody else, like tell me about yourself. <laughs> There's a lot to know. Um, but yeah, so the short version basically um, for work, you know, I'm the CMO for Numa Media, um, web development and design agency out of Denver, Colorado. Uh, over the last year, basically being a part of Numa, I joined them in February and we essentially went from you know, $7,000 months into hundred K plus thousand dollar months. We've kind of scaled this agency to like seven figures, um, in under 12 months. So that wow. has been an absolute blast. That is like my day in day out work. So yeah, as a CMO there, um, it is a lot of marketing strategy really focused on, I mean, it's an, it's becoming a really big buzzword, but like in like the demand generation space, you know, like how can we create content? and distribute it in front of our audience that, you know, by the time they're hit with something as far as like, I guess a sales conversation or they, you know, have a conversation with somebody on our sales team that they're already like really high intent buyers. Our sales conversations are shorter, but yeah. So, I mean, we can jump into that or as little as, you know, as much as you want, but um, day to day. Yeah. It's just like a lot of marketing strategy, basically figuring out how every time we get somebody into our you know, into our quote unquote buyer's funnel that they've already self-qualified sales becomes easy. Um, and overall we can make a lot more money as a company. Um, but that's really like, I guess what you'd call my background as far as work. Um, yeah, as far as life, <laughs> there's a lot that goes on outside of that. You know, I live up in the UP in Michigan, um, pretty outdoorsy guy, but I would say the majority of my life and passion revolves around, you know, the marketing space, the business stuff. I have my hands in a lot of other companies that either I'm trying to build um, or else, yeah, doing my personal consulting with my clients outside of NUMA. Gotcha. Yeah, I talked to a, a guy the other day on LinkedIn um, who said that you were an adjunct professor at one of his uh, his classes. And oh, that's really? How he, yeah, that's how he connected <laughs> with uh, with me because he had connected with you and then, you know, just as a, a roundabout. But, um, but yeah, he said that he was taking a class and you came and taught. So if you could tell me about your education. Ooh, um, like from my experience, like as a whole, hundred percent, yeah, <laughs> yeah like everything awesome. unfiltered <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So yeah. Um, I mean, dude, in high school I was a terrible student. Like it was C's average. Like there's the occasional like B's and D's that threw in there, no A's. Um, and basically decided like regular college was not for me. Um, mm -hmm. picked up art school, went to Columbia college in Chicago for a year the most amazing experience as a film student, like totally awesome. Uh, kind of realized I was paying way too much to do something that like I could definitely do as a hobby. Like a lot of, you know, the skill set expertise, it's just how many hours have you spent behind a camera, right? Like, yeah. do you know your shit or do you not? Um, I was like, okay, I'm not going to pay this much to go to school for something. That's like a really big passion of mine. I'm just going to go learn basically mm -hmm. funneled myself into Michigan tech as a biology major. And I was like, okay, I was good wow. at biology in high school. Um, and I don't know what else I want to do, but it's like pretty affordable tuition. My friends and family are back in Michigan. I'm just going to go check it out and see if I can get this like really basic generalized education and then figure mm. it out from there. Right. Um, yeah. After about three semesters, I basically failed out of school. Um, I tell people it was like a GPA that looked like gas prices from the nineties. It was just <laughs> like, it was like pretty brutal. And it was a, it was a clear stance on obviously biology was never, never my thing. Like, right. I just, I'm not the kind of person. Um, and then after a semester off re-enrolled back at Michigan tech for a marketing degree and just kind of like found my niche, um, mm. boosted it through college was lucky enough to have like 12 month year round internships in town, working on marketing and manufacturing defense engineering, um, a little bit of retail hospitality, but overall got my background there. And then, mm. yeah, it was like a, it was like a five and a half year college stint for me. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So what was the passion though? Like previously, you know, people will talk about, you know, if you've got guys that had a passion, you know, for music or whatever, and then they, you know, move into something similar to that, or did you have a passion that kind of led you to marketing or what was high school looking like for you as I far as that? People. 
right? Mm. Like if there's any, like if there's ever one thing I was good at, it was understanding, have, having conversations and building relationships with people, right? It was like something that came so naturally. Um, and I like actually what put me in to marketing is it was like a Saturday. We we're at a bar with one of my buddies who had just graduated from Michigan tech, came back into town mm. and we're like pretty loaded drunk at the bar. And he's telling me about his job and mind you, like, I'm not even going to school at this point. I'm in my gap semester. I'm not doing anything. Okay. And he was just like telling me about his job. And I was like, Oh, that's it. Like, that's mm. the thing that I didn't realize that I could get paid to do was to understand people help them, you know, provide them with solutions, basically just like build these relationships and make their businesses be improved just by showing up and making the space a better place. Mm. And so it was kind of thing that just like made way too much sense. Yeah. Right. Like I was like, I can't even believe this is an opportunity. And um, yeah, the more I explored it, it was just kind of like, this is a no brainer. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so going into, you had internships and stuff like that. What was uh, the drive? Cause when I met you, you had just launched unemployable. Oh, right? when you, yeah, when you met me last year, I had just quit yeah. my job. Right. Right. So let's <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, out, of, out of college, um, I did the self-employment thing for like three months okay. and I was basically just like, I knew nothing, right? Like I knew marketing, but I knew nothing about owning and operating a business. I didn't know how to work with clients. Um, I didn't know how to make them want to work with me. I just assumed that my education and knowledge was like, oh, that's enough to pay you for it. But, you know, we both know now there's a lot more in business than just having a skill set. Right. Um, so ended up doing this passion project, like rebranding the town I lived in. The owner of this local agency saw it, read through it, called me and was basically like, look, I like the way you think. I want to bring you in. I want to see what's possible. And um, long story short, we ended up working together for about a year that agency got sold to somebody else. We had misaligned values, um, really just different visions for what that company could be. And it wasn't a great mm -hmm. fit. And I decided to, you know, take my skill sets and see what I could do for a second time trying to be self-employed. Right. This time, gladly worked out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's what kind of led you into. So I didn't know the backstory, but I guess you and David Riggs mm -hmm. had quite a bit to do with unemployed. I thought that was just you. No. Um, yeah. So tell me about, tell me about David Riggs and his, uh, <laughs> yeah. his play. Well, on that. Well, a, I mean, we were just talking about it before, right? Like LinkedIn, such a, such a powerful place. Yeah. Um, and so I just quit my job. David had just quit his and had started Numa at that point and like was diving full time into it. Mm. And we connected in like January and then it was, you know, maybe a month and a half after that. And he called me again. He was like, you said you did marketing, right? Like we didn't talk business at all on our call. Um, but again, just like connected. And it was one of those things where you know who you want to work with. Like you want that person in your space, whatever yeah. the skill set is, we can make it work. And he was like, yeah, you said you did marketing, right? And I was like, yep. And he's like, great. I have a job for you. Um, it's one project. I just need some insight. Like come in and do this. I'll pay you a couple hundred yeah. bucks. It's like, sweet. So we did one, we did two. We did seven and then it was like, okay, we got to figure out this relationship and basically what turned into, you know, what I'm doing for now at NUMA. But um, yeah, since we had like both quit our jobs, it was just like the running joke we had of like, we're unemployable. Like you can't hire us. Um, mm. We don't want to be hired. Like even if you said you would offer us a job, we'd probably turn you down because of, you know, one, we had pretty big visions. We wanted to do things under our own roof, but two, it's like, you know, meeting that potential or those things that you want to do, which a lot of times get stifled in a corporate environment or, you know, when you don't have full control over your ability to execute on those creative ideas for business. Um, you know, there's just like a lot of uneasiness there. Good jobs won't do that to you. Hence why me and David now are, you know, have such a great relationship at NUMA. Um, but with yeah. that unemployable stuff, we were just like, you know, there's a lot of people who are kind of in the same boat. Um, the majority of clothing brands that talk about entrepreneurship are about the hustle, the grind, the making the millions, all this other stuff. And ours was just like, it'll be a fun play on being unemployable for the sake of being unemployable. Right. right? Like even if you make $200 a month and that's all you need to live, like whatever you're doing it because you know, you have this goal, this vision, this thing that you want to build. And it's basically not going to be able to be achieved under somebody else's rules or jurisdiction. So, right. Yeah. We developed yeah. a clothing company. We sell some clothes and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's super cool. So like when I had met you, I loved the whole brand and the idea behind it. But it it really clicked with me that we live in an age where starting a business is not as complicated and um, fraught with disaster as it used to be. 
you know, and it's a lot easier to start a business and people will start it. I mean, I met Connor Jones recently, who's running a business here in Florida, in my state, from his bed. Like the dude yeah. just works completely and it makes good money and his business is really successful. And so like what's really cool about unemployable, but also what I think the our generation is moving more into is this idea that I don't really have to play by an old school set of rules and I can make the rules as I go. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? Is basically like you can create your own job. And the reality is, especially like with a rising population, like you can like step out of your house, throw a ball in a five mile radius. And there's probably a hundred people who would buy your services. Yeah. Right. The name of the game becomes, can you find them? Can you, you know, show and make them believe there's value in it and actually make a difference for them. But, you know, even if there's a market that is crazy saturated, there's still more than enough opportunity to actually have a business in that space. Yeah. Like very rarely is a market so saturated that you can't find a way to make a living for yourself. Sure. You might right. not be, you know, a 30 person business and being as big as you want, but if you want to be self-employed, there's more than enough opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. I made a post, <clears throat> I think yesterday about, you know, this, this hot sauce that I make mm -hmm. and, um, and I make like, I just make it for me now, but it did run through my head. I was like, maybe I could, you know, put some labels on this and sell it. And the reality is I just, it's too much time investment for me to, to run with it right now. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's just not something I really want to chase down. Yeah. If I had started that and hot sauce is an extremely saturated market, especially now it's become like the trendy thing. You know, everybody's got this cool hot sauce that they like, mm -hmm. but if I had made it, you know, Florida made local, I could make decent money in a small space just in my, you know, sphere of influence here locally and have a, a successful business right here. And mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to take the brand all the way up to the whole country or international. You know, there's just such a wide range of, of possibility for people if you know how to use it correctly. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the biggest things people who start their own businesses I even put that in quotes, like even just trying to be like self-employed as a single solopreneur, really get caught up in this fact of like, in order to be successful, I have to do what the people who are already successful are doing, right? So they try to basically like in that, meaning they try to do everything at once mm. of like, oh, in order for my business to achieve success, I have to have these huge marketing campaigns and I have to build out this team and have this rock and branding. But the reality is of like all of all of the things that you think you have to do are a result of the success, not the thing that equals the success, right? Like being able to build it up, like you're saying, like small locally, one region first, and then move to another and then move to another, but like building that foundation first and then slowly adding things in is going to be a lot more effective than, yeah, like trying to do everything at once, burning yourself out. And because you're doing 10 things, none of them are getting done right. And you're not able to actually find like what works and what doesn't. But yeah, I guess I just, I see that a lot as like a huge mistake people make as they start yeah. their businesses. It's similar to Justin Rowe in the, the last episode was talking about, or the second episode, yours is going to be actually a few episodes down the line once <laughs> we get here. Um, but Justin Rowe was talking about how, you know, all these entrepreneurs will come and be like, yeah, working 80 hours a week is overrated. You should just work like 30 and, you know, automate everything and let your business just run on its own. But he was like that. People who are starting a business in the beginning don't have that luxury. You know, you have to start somewhere to get somewhere else. And I think a lot of people think I can, you know, start where the big dogs are and I can run a business the way everybody else does. But that person started way back here. You know what I mean? <laughs> they didn't start selling hot sauce to the entire nation. They started with the local area and built on and built on. So, yeah, you do have to put in that work at the beginning in order to have that freedom at the backside. But I think even more importantly is understanding like what your priorities are when you get into business, right? Mm. You don't get the 15 to 30 hour work weeks if you want to reach a million dollars in 12 months, right? Mm. That doesn't happen. You do get that if you're okay with making 30, 40 grand a year off the start, right? Like then you can scale right. back. But where the biggest misconception is like, okay, I want the money and the freedom, which is like, great, you can have both. It's going to take a long time. But when you just start, it's like pick which one matters most and then dive into it. You know, don't say you want the huge seven figure business, but you only want to operate 15 hours a week. Mm -hmm. You're going to have some kind of misalignment and struggle there. But then also don't say that you want all this freedom and then be upset when your business isn't scaling to seven figures. Right. And so there's like a huge lesson that like, sure, you can have both, but you have to sacrifice one of the two at the front 
Mm. Right. And just like being super, super clear of I'm going to be self-employed. I'm going to go start this business. Which one matters to me the most now? Like, why am I getting into this? And then actually committing on getting the thing you say you want, which is either right. free time or money. Right. <laughs> Very rarely is it both. Um, but yeah, so I did want to cover that because I think it's really, really important. And obviously in my personal consulting, um, I deal with a lot of clients who are in that space of like, I want both. I want to automate everything. I'm like, great, mm. you can do that, but you have to understand it manually first. Right. right. If you can't do it yourself, how are you going to teach somebody else how to do it? Exactly. Then going back into um, basically what you were asking about NUMA, um, do you want to rephrase that question? Yeah. So how do you guys view like when somebody wants to go from uh, like a sol solopreneur, right? And you've explained with them, explained to them the process of, you know, you have to put in the work in the beginning. You have to understand things. You're going to have to put in the hours because you don't have the revenue yet. Mm -hmm. um, how do you help them understand that that process is going to scale up over time and that you can, but it, it's going to require work? Yeah. And well, so, I mean, the nice part is that's usually where my personal consulting steps in, right? That's, which is now a NUMA service, I guess. I still refer to that, but as of February, um, I'll consult directly through NUMA, which would be awesome. Yeah. But NUMA as a whole outside of, you know, what I do one-on-one -on -one with clients is kind of nice in the standpoint that our target audience is a little bit, if they're past there, right? We're mm -hmm. working with some larger companies, larger corporations. They have a good amount of money already in the bank. They have a really strong sales pipeline. They know what kind of revenue is coming in the door over the next few months that marketing and the stuff that we can help them with and add on top of what they're doing is an add-on, right? They're mm -hmm. not reliant on these activities that, you know, that could potentially take six to nine months to start seeing some ROI to support their entire business, right? We get to work with them in the stance of great. We're already doing SEO for you. That's driving a ton of traffic. We need to take this SEO content, redistribute it. So you're getting, you know, three, four times the payback and the, you know, the amount of content in general that's getting in front of your audience before you're even having a conversation with them. Mm. And so, yeah, we, we do kind of, we're in a good market where we're not doing a lot of convincing, selling, having to tell them that, you know, this is going to scale your business in the long term. And it's usually because that's how they found us or they've been following us and they just go, you know, we want what you guys are doing. Give it to us. What's the price? Mm. And it's all, you know, there's not a whole lot of actual like selling or proof of value in those conversations. You tend to focus on larger scale businesses that kind of already have that that trade off established, right? They have the money, so they're not having to invest the time and they're just trying to outsource tasks. Or do you guys do a combination of both where you spend time sitting down with them and educating them how to do everything on their own? Yeah, it's a little bit of both, right? Like at the end of the day, if we have a client come to us and say, hey, we want to work with you for six months, we want to get a strategy in place. We kind of want to learn your process, how this is going to work. And then we're just going to take your process and bring it in-house. We would love, mm -hmm. like, we're happy to do that for a client, right? Okay. Like if they're going to work with us for six months and we can teach them how to do it and they can do it themselves, we're never going to be valuable to them anyways. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the ones it's like, we don't, we want to be fully hands-off. Great. We also have a service for that. We're, we're gladly going to make you hands off and help you create content and distribute it and, you know, drive traffic to a website that we probably just built for you. It's like, that's necessarily like, yeah, it's ideal because obviously those are <laughs> higher paying clients, but like, we also are very, very in the realm of like, we're here to just make or help you out, like make you a better business owner. Mm. Right. At our, our number one goal through NUMA is at the end of the day, everybody that works with us should be smarter, more educated, better business owners in general, right? Just from right. being in contact. So yeah, when it comes to like targeting, especially for content stuff, it's a mix of both. Okay. I gotcha. So let's uh, shift gears, talk about okay. LinkedIn. So okay. we talked in the beginning about how um, when I had first connected with you and was like truly really trying to explore LinkedIn more seriously, mm -hmm. um, I had no idea what I was doing. Had no clue. And still for many months after our conversation, still had no idea what I was doing. Um, not to say that I like have, you know, the magic recipe yeah. now. But um, but yeah, so when we first talked, I made some comments about how businesses are, they're all losers and they need to, you know, put more time into developing their their material that they put on LinkedIn. And um, I don't remember offhand what your answer was, but I quickly realized that I am the arrogant little kid that's very ignorant <laughs> of proper proper strategy, um, which is kind of the inspiration for this podcast is just talking to people and coming up with uh, wisdom or, or lessons learned from these other people. And so your content was one of the first ones that I really started looking at when I built 
basically what I do now as far as strategy for LinkedIn and my content. Um, what is your philosophy when it comes to the trade-off between developing really, really excellent content and the return of investment you see from LinkedIn content? Um, yeah, but I mean, like, so that's the thing, right? Is the good content is going to develop the bigger ROI, right? And like, it just depends like what you consider to be good content. Mm. Um, you know, you get a lot of people talk about this, like, yeah, good content should be the stuff that's providing an ROI or it's the stuff that's going to get you the most engagement or the biggest reach. And the reality is like, if you want somebody to buy from, you know, your company and you want to use LinkedIn as that source of revenue or like as your marketing in general, that content has to be stuff that makes them want to buy from you. And not necessarily that that doesn't always mean the stuff that's going to get the most engagement. Right. Like how much how much stuff do you read through LinkedIn on a day to day basis that you don't engage with? Or if you do engage with it, it might just because you're like checking the box to make sure you engage with some people that you normally wouldn't, whatever. But you know, LinkedIn's not it's not Instagram, it's not Twitter. Like you can just scroll and get a ton of value without ever clicking a like or making a comment. Right? There's a ton of people I follow on LinkedIn that I've never engaged with, but I love the stuff that they do. Hmm. And at the end of the day, when it comes to needing a service, they're top of mind and I know exactly where to go. So my philosophy with like good content on LinkedIn is exactly what I say our philosophy is through Numa is that if somebody lands on my content or on my page, are they going to be smarter? Are they going to become more educated? Are they, are they going to be happier people, better business owners, you know, really whatever that thing is of like, once they come in contact with me, did they leave going, you know, that was helpful. My life is better. And I think like coming from that place and especially understanding like, okay, this is who I'm trying to talk to. This is what I know they struggle with. This is the solution that I can provide to them, right? If I'm showing up and consistently being able to provide that style of content where their problems are consistently getting solved because my content's in their life, well, great. When they can't do it in-house anymore, when they no longer have the capabilities or the actual education and they want a custom situate, custom solution, you know, they have a clear cut answer. And so I just think like, yeah, I guess philosophy on LinkedIn really comes down to not necessarily how educational can I be, but how useful can I be to the people I really want to be useful for? Right? Right. There's a ton of stuff you can do that's going to get likes, engagements. Half the polls I see on there asking people how many cups of coffee they drink in a day of like, great, that might get your name out in front of a bunch of people. But if I don't understand what you do or how that's going to make my life better, you're rarely going to be the person I come to to solve my problem. Right. right. So it's, yeah, I mean, a little bit of a double-edged sword. But yeah, not really either. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an, an interesting environment because, I mean, you talk about vanity metrics and, and that's really what a lot of LinkedIn is, is just content mm -hmm. to get stuff. And I won't lie, like some of the stuff that I've put out that got the most engagement and has provided me with opportunities has been purely vanity metrics. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like provided no um, benefit to me, really, other than building a network and being able to spread um my name in other people's, you know, feeds. Um, so what do you think the balance between growing that audience and actually getting a return of investment, right? Because we're talking about some of the content you never engage with and never do anything. Then I'm in the same boat. Some people I've been watching for ages and, and not interacted hardly at all with their content. Um, but what is the trade off between um, building that audience and actually producing content that will get you an ROI? I think it's producing content. It's going to get you an ROI 100 to zero. Like legitimately from the standpoint of like we do a really interesting, I guess not interesting, some companies are starting to pick it up, but it's one of my favorite things that we do. Um, and it's basically the way we collect, you know, attribution of sale, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, you found one, if you just booked a call or you just signed a proposal with us and you're paying us money, how did you find us? And what was the thing that you saw that made you actually like pull the trigger to convert to work with us, right? Because those are two totally different conversations. Yeah. And so when we look at that, we go, okay, how many people are actually mentioning the fact that they've loved the content we've been putting out? Because that starts to show us how many people are coming in from one avenue or another. And our goal essentially is to make sure that, you know, at least 50% of our pipeline is coming through of people who have watched our social content. Mm. So we're going to know the way we judge, judge our social content and what we put on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter is, are we getting an increase in the amount of people 
who are coming through our pipeline saying that they're there because of our social content, right? That's how we know it's working, that we're getting people who are actually giving us these responses. Hmm. The reason that that's good is because, you know, when you ask what's the trade-off and I say hundred to zero is that my audience could be a hundred people. If each one of those hundred people are willing to buy from me once a year, right? My audience could be very, very, very small. If the content I'm putting out is continuously getting them to buy into our product. Hmm. So the ROI becomes the most important when, and then the reality is when you start making content that is less engagement pushing, what's going to happen is sure your leads are going to cut down, right? You're going to have less people coming through your pipe because your audience is overall just going to be smaller, but you will notice is that, you know, the, the intent of the buyer, like the qualification of the lead itself is going to be increased. Because the content you're putting out, the thing that they're actually engaging with you, the reason they're reaching out to you, they're no, they know exactly what they're getting through your social content. It's not, you know, hey, let's send out a bunch of cold emails. Let's trick all these people into hitting on a landing page, going through click funnels, and then, you know, getting 100 people into a qualifying call where only five close. It's like, great, only 20 people came through, but 15 of them closed. Mm. Which one is better at the end of the day when you're counting raw numbers? Is I'd rather have 15 close than a hundred coming through the top of funnel. Yeah. So yeah, always, always push for ROI, not in the sense of like, oh, each piece of content should convert. It's, you know, over the course of a 90 day period, a certain percentage of our sales should mention the fact that they are converting because of what they saw on social. That's good, man. That's solid. I like that a lot. It's definitely a, a challenge, I think, for especially me, right? So um, when I used to make content on LinkedIn, I would literally just post like random videos and pictures and stuff like that, which like was the amount of time that I wanted to invest in that. You know what I mean? Just no, no time really in the LinkedIn. And, um, and I was getting the exact thing that I should have gotten for that little amount of time invested. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and right now in working to develop more of a call to action for no let media and whatever I'm going to build next um, is definitely something that has to be the first thing I think developed and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you don't have like a very clear direction, there's really no point in, in developing LinkedIn content because LinkedIn is for B2B, right? And it's not yeah. something that, you know, somebody's going to be walking around like, oh yeah, I want to buy a sweatshirt. You might run into somebody who wants to buy a sweatshirt. Hey, off of LinkedIn. Unemployable crushes on LinkedIn. Really? Yeah. Dang. Okay. That's, that's where, like, unemployable crushes on LinkedIn more than we'd ever hit on Instagram. Well, like, it's it's because the market. Market. Yeah. 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 Which makes sense. But um, but you know what I mean. Like you're not yeah. you're not producing uh, candy bars, right? Yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't have a good example for this right yeah. now. But um, when you develop content, when you're developing even a website even anything that's going to be getting traction for building that ROI. If you don't have a clear direction or a step-by-step -step process of where you want your customers to land, there really is no point in spending time on LinkedIn content. Yeah. But I would say like, even with that as well, right. It's, it's, you only need to really clear that first step of like, what do I want them to know and understand? Because a lot of times they will, like, if you can get them to know, understand, and then like buy in and actually want to talk to you about the things that you're talking about, the buyer is going to make their own choices in where they go, right? You could provide them a thousand buttons on like, hey, check this out, check this out, check this out. But if it's not going to be a value to them, nobody's going to click anyways, mm. right? Where it's, it's like, if you know how you want them to feel or what you want them to learn through your content, you're going to create content continuously that covers that topic. And at the end of the day, they're going to understand it, right? Like the amount of times I've talked about my journey from quitting my job and being self-employed and like figuring out and going through it mixed with how much I talk about how you can improve your website. It's amazing that the engagement I get might be almost zero, mm. but then each week, the amount of people who reach out, who I've never even heard of before, it's like, Hey, I've been following your content. Just wanted you to know this is really helpful. Great. That is like that one piece is much better than 15 likes from people I know who aren't going to buy from me. Yeah. And so it's just like, yeah, okay. Having, you know, yes, you want to basically like push them to take an action to do something. But if you're not clear on what that message is going to be, what they should know at the end of the day, 
you're going to be looking at, okay, this piece of content didn't get any likes. This one got a lot of likes. I'm going to start writing more stuff like this. And like, sure, great. It's going to get that engagement you want, but it's not delivering the message that you showed up to deliver. Mm. And that's where you screw yourself over because then you're like, people want to meet you. They want to talk to you, but it's not for the right reason, right? They're not coming to buy the thing that you truly want to sell. Yeah. And so, yeah. It's finding that balance. Like, yes, you have to have a clear direction, but you don't need them to go to a landing page, drive traffic to a website. If the content's good, they will do that on their own. Right. Right. LinkedIn is very unique <clears throat> in the sense of it, it is very similar to social media marketing in, in, in any form that you want to think, but it's different in the sense of, um, there's not a lot of opportunity for somebody to be making a LinkedIn video or LinkedIn post to be selling ad space. You know what I mean? I guess you could yeah. in theory, if you wanted to, if you could sign up for some brand deal with somebody, um, Whereas with other forms of social media, you can make a video about a dog, you know what I mean? Going and being found on the street homeless. And you see what I'm saying? You, if you can yeah. draw an emotion out of people, you can have a really successful time with most social media platforms. The LinkedIn is not the same because you can get all the vanity metrics you want. And that would be the end of it. Yeah, a hundred percent. But that's where it comes down to is right? like, not every platform is going to work for everybody. Right. And kind of what we were talking about before, of like trying to do all the things, right? You see a new company come to market, they have a LinkedIn account, they have an Instagram account, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, podcast, and they're trying to create this. And what happens? Burnout almost immediately. Right. And they go from doing it on all platforms to doing it on no platforms and focusing on how do we get revenue in the door? Okay. Right. First things first, you have a business. Who are you talking to? Where are they spending the most amount of the time? What do they want to hear? Great. Start with one brick and put it down and just like basically crush it until you get all the information you need. And then in your free time from there is like, hey, we have a little bit of this space. What if we developed a podcast? What if we started getting on Twitter and getting, you know, just gauging the interaction there? What if we started going on LinkedIn, engaging some interaction there? And it's like piece by piece that allows you to tweak instead of have to fully revamp your marketing consistently. Mm. Because each platform is going to be different, right? Like I said, we've been in business all year. We've been marketing on LinkedIn like crazy. Mm -hmm. And we just expanded to Twitter a month ago. And our oh, wow. Twitter is blowing up. But it's because on the platform that actually worked for us, which was LinkedIn, we were able to gauge what kind of content got responses. What do people see as the most useful content? Well, great. Now mm -hmm. we have this entire case study of useful content from the place that we're getting the biggest sample size you could say right because it's where our audience is right take that bring that to a platform we're not familiar with and immediately target the people we know who are going to respond to this and then just watch it escalate mm. but so it's like if we would have just hit twitter at the beginning we would have just said twitter doesn't work yeah but it's not that twitter it doesn't work we didn't have the information we needed to make twitter work and so if you're always trying to figure out what works on what content yeah you're going to get burnt out or you're going to say the platform doesn't work like every platform works. Yeah. You have to figure out the way to make it the most useful to you and your market for your audience. Right. I don't really like LinkedIn is by far my favorite platform personally. Yeah. I always sure. on LinkedIn. I enjoy it. It's it's fun for me. Um, I don't like Instagram. I don't really <laughs> like Twitter. I've never used TikTok. Don't really have a desire to. You know what I mean? I'm very much not the the 24 year old stereotype of like constantly <laughs> being on social media. Yeah. But um, something that I'm even commenting to my wife is like, I don't even like want to spend time like doing anything for Instagram. And she's like, Well, I mean, if you want to build a photography or videography business, that's probably the best place for you to be. Which mm -hmm. I don't know if it is or not, but um. But it really is, it comes down to creating the right content for the right platform, you know, because the stuff that works on LinkedIn for me does not at all work on Instagram, like at all on Instagram. Yeah. And so that's a really interesting thought about taking time to, to build a case study on one platform to then translate to another and see what works there instead of just throwing it all out there and hoping that something sticks. Well, right, because it's not necessarily that like your the thoughts, the ideas, the content you want to portray or that you do portray on LinkedIn won't work on Instagram, but you have to package it much, much differently, hmm. right? There's probably a lot of people who will absorb the same things you talk about, but you have to 
you have to distribute it and showcase it in a way that makes it interesting for them. Right. Or that they're willing to absorb because you're going to absorb content differently. Right. Like for example, at NUMA, our content distribution strategy, we kind of do the opposite of what I've just been talking about. Like for a content space, like, yeah, we focused on one platform, but now, okay, we're producing three to five podcasts a week. Like they might yeah. be 10 minutes, but like, just to like get the content, the different range of topics out there. We do um, audio and video. We take the audio basically distribute it as the full podcast. We have a writer take that audio, turn it into a blog. We take those videos, cut them into mini clips that we can redistribute. We have different styles of video clips then. That's where we're starting to change platform to platform. It's like LinkedIn has a much style of video that Instagram does. Yeah. The time clips and the content can be the exact same. We're just making one a reel and the one on Instagram might be even a little bit longer and it's going to have captions and a heading, right? Just because it's the way they absorb it differently. And then we're taking the Instagram content and we're distributing it also on TikTok. But mm. it's like, great. So we have the rhythm of executing. We just know that we can pump that out on a weekly basis. Now optimizing that becomes a lot easier than trying to optimize before we're ready to execute. So now mm. we notice like, okay, why are these performing really well on Instagram, but not on TikTok? And it's like, oh, TikTok has a different trend that's going on right now. It's like, great, because we can pull something from that video we just recorded that isn't necessarily we clipped for Instagram, but now we're watching for those video sections as we're cutting of like, we can just take that piece for TikTok, this piece for Instagram, this piece mm. for. Gotcha. But we're still in the process of like going through and cutting. We're just now more aware of like, okay, what platform is this going to? Does it need to be packaged differently? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. But so we're still doing it all at once. You know, we're not right. creating multiple different pieces of content. We're just making sure that it gets packaged and distributed. Right. Correct. Right. Which is something I'm learning right now. And <clears throat> I mean, this is. What I love about doing this right now is because I'm going through growing pains, you know what I mean? And <laughs> learning how to do all this stuff. And I love yeah. that because this is, I get to ask people a bunch of questions, whereas, you know, you'll get all this audio you guys can use for whatever you want to promote and anything that you say <laughs> here is for you. But I learn as well as doing the same for my own business. For um, sure. And so I'm learning that from here, but also I put out a poll at the beginning of, or yesterday about the length of this podcast, right? Which I, I think polls I are... I comment on that, by the way. I totally got distracted. I know exactly what post you're talking about. I had a comment written and then it got, I got distracted. So. Oh, okay. I gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So what I think is super interesting about polls in general, but especially that one, is that the results are like not at all what I expected them to be. And I think every time I put out a poll, it's like that. Can you what they were? Yeah, sure. So... Let me pull them up really quick. I'm curious to see what they were, and then I'm going to give you my two cents on the on the topic. Okay. So we got 56% is for 30 minutes. We got yeah. 23 is for 45 minutes, and then only 21% went to the hour plus. Oh, okay. So the reason why I'm surprised by that is because when somebody puts out a 30-minute podcast, this is the way I absorb podcasts. Fair enough. It's not the same way as everybody else. I, when I take a long drive, or I'm doing some like dumb mundane task like grocery shopping, that's when I put on podcasts and I absorb the information because I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. It's just a regular yeah. task. So yep. for me, when somebody puts out something 30 minutes or less, I'm disappointed. So I'm like, I can't do anything in 30 minutes. Like everything's gonna take an hour at least, you know? And so when somebody puts out a podcast, it's like 45, an hour, two hours, I'm like, awesome. I'm going to be chewing on this for days, for days. And I'm super excited about it. But then people were commenting, it's like, oh, yeah, I listen to a show that's eight minutes long. Mm -hmm. I've never, <clears throat> ever listened to a podcast that was that short. But you're saying you guys sometimes will put out podcasts that are like 10 minutes long. Yeah, but we'll also do podcasts that are an hour. Right. right? So it's what the way I see it, right? Your podcast should be it like length doesn't dictate anything, right? The, uh, the level of the content should incredibly engaging, high value, deep dive conversation shouldn't be cut off because somebody wants to enjoy a short podcast. It should be, you know, really dove into it to make sure that you uncover all the information, you know, cliche Joe Rogan goes three and a half hours. Well, right. He has people on there that you wouldn't get to hear speak anywhere else. You would hope right. that they're on there for the three hours if they're only going to be on once. Yeah. Right. So for us, it's like we bring a guest on who we really want to hear speak. We have a lot of questions. We're going to give them the space to make sure that all the information we needed to uncover can sit there. Mm. On the other side of things, there's me and David who show up and we go, hey, 
all we're going to talk about today is the simple basics of SEO, the three things people need to hear before they hire an agency, whether it's us or not. We can crush that out in eight to 12 minutes because we know, you know, we're not elaborating on anything. There's no fluff. Right. There's no conversation to be had. It's a very stern, this is what it is. And right. so if somebody just needs that like small piece of information, we're not going to make them sit through an hour to get all three pieces. We're going to go, here they are, take and enjoy or go to the next one. So now they can learn a lot of very like fast cut content in an hour versus an hour of one topic. So it's like a little bit of both and just goes back to what I was saying about, you know, you have to package it depending on what the content is. And so if you can do it really short and it can be an incredibly high valued podcast in eight minutes, crush it. But yeah. if you need the hour to explore the idea and learn a lot about a person and, you know, their thought process and mentality and that stuff's important to the topic at hand. Well, great. Give it the hour, the hour and a half, the two hours, whatever it needs. If it's going to be valuable back to the consumer. Right. But if it's length for length, it doesn't do anything. And if it's short, just to be short and quick, well, that doesn't do anything for me either. Right. right? Like you right. want the idea to be, you want the idea to be fully finished mm. by the time the podcast is done. You don't want anything like hanging out in the air of like, well, why didn't they go deeper into that? Yeah. Which I'm not that type of person. And everything. So the one I did, the very first episode with George speak was 30 minutes. And that was because my, my camera died in the middle of this interview. <laughs> I was so mad too. I finally, I got the last two questions. So it was usable. <clears throat> but I was really upset that it got cut short, but I did like Justin Rowe is an hour and 11 minutes. And that was just, I asked all the questions I could think of. And I enjoyed the conversation. Like I went back and I've listened he's to that a podcast great guy. He's four awesome. times, dude, he's awesome. He's so cool. Um, I did one with, uh, with Ryan French. We went at Ryan French and I, after we finished talking, talked for another 45 minutes. So I have like a <laughs> two hour plus recording between me and Ryan, I think. That's um, awesome. Yeah. So there's some people that I, I'm not the type of person that's going to cut you off for a time. Yeah. My analysis there was more, are there people out there? Like, cause my wife is a type of person, like will listen to something that's only a certain length. Right. And, and that's because some people listen to podcasts because of entertainment yeah. um, and not necessarily a deep dive on a concept. I don't like really listening to podcasts about entertainment. It's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. um, but how many people out there do absorb podcast where they go, Oh, it's over a half hour. I don't really want to listen to it. I don't know. I don't well, know. So that's, that's where you get like the benefit of that, right? Is like you have this content, that's where you get to redistribute it in a way that makes sense of like, you can take this conversation that we're having here today mm -hmm. and you can put it all over your LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever over the next month and a half. So it's like, even though people are only consuming these two minute segments of this conversation, they're seeing each two minute segment. They're just absorbing it over a longer period of time. Right. But you still like, so, you know, there's somebody that don't listen to podcasts at all. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to redistribute this content, then your podcast is never going to get to them. But like I said, you know where they're spending time. Oh, the majority of my audience is on LinkedIn, but they don't listen to podcasts. Well, great. Create this podcast for the other people that do and still mm -hmm. utilize this content as a value add to you in the spaces where they are going to spend time. Right. Like it doesn't right. make sense. Like if you're only on LinkedIn to say, Hey, you know, go to Spotify, Apple music and listen to this podcast. People are like, well, I don't, I'm not going to leave this platform just for you. Like bring mm. that platform to me. And so the better that you can do that, the more, you know, they're going to stick around and absorb more of your content. Yeah. It's almost impossible to get people to change patterns. Yeah. Right. So you have to change yours for them. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've met a lot of people who don't believe that. And they think that I'm just going to keep going and people need to, you know, bend to my will. And it <clears throat> never works. It will never work. But so my favorite analogy is like um, diaper companies will usually target like new dads, right? So from like somebody who's not already in, like they're not going to, diaper companies aren't going to market to people who are on their fourth kid, right? Because yeah. that family is already in the process of buying a certain brand of diapers. And it's right. going to be a lot harder to get them to switch brands after three kids than it is for mm. somebody who's never bought diapers before. Good point. I, yeah. So it's like, it's going to like, it's just hard. It's so hard for people to actually switch the pattern that they're currently in. Mm. It's like, great. You can do the same thing on social media. If you know, the majority of your audience is already stuck in a way. Don't go, Oh, this is the way I like to make content. And this is the way I'm going to distribute it. Like, come check me out. If you like me, it's like, no, you're already here. This is what I'm going to bring to the table. So I wanted to do more cutting up the podcast into smaller forms of, of content that I can put out, just like you're talking about. 
But the other thing I was considering doing, and that's this is the the base for why I put out the poll, was should I make one form of the podcast that is because I do next to no cutting, like it's just straight up the whole conversation. Um, but should I create one that kind of just touches on the highlights of the conversation? You know what I mean? Just just hits the the good points, the things that I think are the most important and see if I can pare that down to something that's like 30 minutes. Because for me, I want to listen to the whole conversation. I will listen to anybody's story and talk to anybody for however long they want to talk to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. But for some other people, they want to get down to the meat and potatoes and that's all they want. They don't want no broth or vegetables, nothing. They just want yeah. the starch and the protein. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know if I'm going to end up doing that, but I do think that developing what you're saying, smaller forms of content to play into the patterns that people already have established is definitely my my go to right now. Um, you, I, know, I know you're a video guy. You do all this yeah. yourself. Yeah. Are you, you're producing everything yourself. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. <laughs> yeah it's at some interesting. point it's gonna be worthwhile to pay somebody else to do this and get your time back <laughs> oh yeah i know it will be but especially right now like it's just not to the point you know and i love building things you have the skill set yeah yeah so i'd love to build it now and if i can scale it up i would love to you know and if i can scale it to being able to say hey here's the full edited podcast you know some or unedited podcast somebody else edit it and then hey you cut portions that would be great that's the dream yeah but just like we were talking about earlier there's a trade-off I don't have the revenue, you know what I mean? I have tons of time though. I could put all my personal time into it, which is yeah. what it is now. So, <laughs> but um, I think that when it comes to developing content, right? With this podcast and developing things to grow it, I'm definitely learning a lot more about putting in time to things that actually convert. Like we were talking about getting a return investment. Mm -hmm. um, what would be your advice to me, who's doing everything on his own, about putting out things to convert, right? We've talked about playing more to people's patterns with my content so that the podcast can grow as a result of seeing content that I'm already putting out on LinkedIn. They don't have to leave to go to Apple Podcasts, but what would be your other suggestion to me? Customer insights, um, like just through and through, that's, man, marketing so simple. Um, it can be very complex and it can be hard work, but at the end of the day, creating good content is very, very simple. So, you know, the more people that you know that are in your space, who you're looking to convert, it's those simple questions of like, who needs to be on? What do you want to hear? Um, like <laughs> those two things alone make a huge difference. And then like, yeah, exactly your poll of like how, what's the best way for you to absorb this, right? Because a lot of times like sad truth about marketing is we don't always get to create the content we want to create. We have to create the content that our consumers want to absorb. And then it comes down to that is, okay, how do we figure out what the consumers want to absorb? and where and how are they going to absorb it, mm. right? So if you can answer those questions, it's like, okay, then now I know my content. I know how to cut it up. I know where to distribute it and I know how to talk about it and like who to bring on and have those conversations. Perfect example of what this could look like um, right at NUMA. So we basically look at our revenue team as sales and marketing, right? But we're, we're a team. It's not sales versus marketing, it's sales and marketing. And we're just in charge of whether or not people are coming through the door. Well, my goal at marketing is to educate our consumers prior to them booking a sales call, right? Mm. So what happens in order to like develop the content is great. Our CRO, Nate, is on sales calls all day long. Nate, what are the most common objections, questions, things people don't understand when they're on the phone with you? He gives me a list. We go and create content about those things that people don't already understand when they're on the phone with Nate. And we make sure we answer it in the content before they get on the phone. Right. So it's like using all of that consumer insight of like, Hey, you know, you guys, I'm a little concerned because I don't feel like you approach it very strategically. Well, great. We're about to create a month's worth of content that shows you how strategic we develop these websites to make mm. sure that we never get an objection on that again. Right. It's answered prior to the sales conversation, shortens the sales process, usually increases the value of the product and extends the lifetime value of the consumer. But what we're doing is we're using those customer insights to develop what we're producing in content in order to increase the conversion rates. Mm. Like just like you talked about though, sometimes when you look at it that way, you're targeting now a much smaller group of people. Yeah. Well, so the amount of people that might listen to your show, the amount of people that are actually going to engage with your stuff or actually convert is going to be lesser because you're getting, you know, more niche down. But the intent of the buyer is going to increase because you're more directly 
targeting their problems, mm. right? You, they already know and trust that you're going to solve that for them, or you understand how to help them get to the next step. It's just that there's less of them. Mm. So yeah, I would say that's, that is definitely like the biggest key point is using those consumer insights to drive your content because then you, it takes the thinking away from marketing. What should I post? How should I do this? It's like, just ask. Cause they'll tell you, mm. right. Especially somebody who's already kind of like piqued their interest. Um, the other thing, like I said, really useful for that is go talk to people who aren't in your pipe yet and just be like, great. You don't want to work with me. Why not? What's the gap in between this? Mm. That was going to be my next question. If you're not getting those insights, if you're getting no feedback, how do you actually get that? Yeah. And a lot of that comes down to, like, I'm a marketing guy, but I don't hate sales. Outbound mm. sales is a uh, absolute necessity for every single business, right? Like you can't grow without them. And the reason people don't do it is because, oh, it doesn't convert a very high number. There's so many objections. They get scared to do it. They don't want to bug or piss people off, seem, you know, disingenuous. Well, it's like, okay. But at the start, it's just like we talked about before, like you got to do that stuff and kind of like eat dirt for a while in order to get the information you need to improve the process. Right. Like you, like you have to fail a ton to increase by 1%. Right. And then once you increase by 1%, it's going to take less failures to increase by two or 3%. And it's going to compound that effort. But yeah, like usually that first run, if you don't have people coming in, giving you customer insights, you got to go create them. Yeah. And that's by having literally as many conversations as possible. But yeah, again, the more number of unqualified leads, the more objections you're going to hit. But it's all data. And data right. lets you optimize and restructure and build systems that actually turn into converting customers down the line. Right. It's all a numbers game and you have to play it out and you 100%. have to see which is, is going to be worth your time. And sometimes like I fall victim to that all the time. Just be like, I don't, I don't really want to put my time into that because it's not going to be worth it. The you know conversion rate is really low and I just don't want to waste my time on it. But it is a numbers game. And that's something Justin Rowe, going back to that again, was explaining is because I, I despise the cold message on LinkedIn. I hate it. It's mm -hmm. so annoying to me and no offense to people who do that. It is, it is a numbers game. You, yeah. know, you have to realize that some people, that's how they do most of their advertising is through sending a message to some random person they've never met or never interacted with and have nothing to really offer, but Hey, please buy my product or can you use my services? Mm -hmm. And even though I'm going to reject you 100% of the time, Bob Jones down the street, you know, or the next person you message on LinkedIn may take you up on your services. And it really comes down to who's ready to receive or who's ready to buy the product that you have to offer. Right. So I have a client who they're, they've seen a lot of success through outbound recently with a two sentence cold message. Right. And it's like, and it comes down to like what we talked about is it ha you, you actually have to be valuable to the consumer. And you have to not do it with the intent of they're going to purchase, right? So it's finding and prospecting those consumers who like legitimately have a need that you or like a problem that you can solve and you find them through prospecting. And you, once you figure out who they are, two sentences, is all you need. Take Numa as like the example client, whatever, stumble across somebody. Hey, found your website. Notice that there's a huge opportunity to improve by doing X, Y, and Z. Happy to give you a free 15 minute phone call if changing this is interesting to you. Mm. Right? Like some people are like already in the market for a website, trying to figure out an agency, but no other agency has told him, you know, those four things are your problem. And now he's like, you know what? It's worth a 15 minute phone call. Great. Mm. Like, so like that can work versus the ones who show up and like, yeah, we did 400, you know, 400 times the ROI for all these customers last year, check out our website, do all these things. It's like, well, that sucks. Cause you know, it's a cold pitch. Mm. So like, Man, outbound can be so simple yet so effective if you're actually going to solve a problem for the consumer and they're in right. the buying window, right? Like it's a lot of it's timing and numbers, but it doesn't have to be like, oh, I hate when cold emails are salesy and they're trying to get you to buy. Like, Don't tell them to click a button. Don't tell them to go to your website. Don't tell them that you have a deal going on. Say, hey, I noticed that this was an issue. Here's three ways you can solve it. And you put the three ways right in the message. So even if they don't respond, the message will still value add. And then it's, if you want to learn more, I'm open to having that discussion with you. But if you don't want to learn more, hopefully this message alone was valuable enough. Mm. Right. So then if you approach it that way, it's impossible to leave a bad taste in someone's mouth when 
you know, even if they don't respond, they could still implement what you told them to implement and be a better business owner or more educated because of it. Right. And so, yeah, like it just makes it less salesy. Like there, there's been a couple people on my LinkedIn messages who I was like, good pitch. Like I I'm booking a call, you know, like I have to, you understood exactly. Like you've read through my content. You understood things. You like, it wasn't just, Hey, I saw that you worked in this, your position. It's like, Hey, you said this really specific thing. And I'm wondering if us talking is worthwhile. Building a partnership is worthwhile. Like, yeah, there's so many ways to go about it. And it's a numbers game, but there's a way to make it simple and really effective. Right. I had somebody send me uh, for for the firm that I work for. They sent me uh, one of our headshots of our partners. They had like photoshopped their body or their head onto a different body. And like sent me this picture was like we do photoshop editing and this said you know she wasn't wearing a very professional shirt so we did this and it was like that's some awesome of the worst photoshop editing i'd ever seen in my <laughs> life but i was like this is actually a pretty creative thing to do you know I mean, you put setting, time and effort into it right right so i like said like thank you i appreciate it and we obviously didn't use the picture but i just mm -hmm. thought it was like wow that's a really creative way to to pitch your services by photoshopping this person on another body but uh -huh. anyways give me your worst advice you ever received and the best advice you ever received i wish i knew the worst advice i've ever received <laughs> like, i feel like it's one of those things like somebody tells you bad advice and you like it's like blocked out and gone for it. Cause you try not to remember the bad advice, you know, it's mm. not useful if you're, if you're thinking about it all the time, but, um, oh man, that's so tough. I would like want to think about the first thing that comes to mind is like, try everything. Mm. Right. Like I used to think that was really good advice until it screwed me over. Um, from like the standpoint, right. Of like, I think trying everything becomes a cop out of like, you can get kind of good at something and you can switch gears to go try something else that like feels better. But the problem is when you never get any more direct satisfaction than when you first are learning something because the learning curve is so exponential, yeah. right? So it's like always that positive reinforcement of I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm getting better. And if you can do that time over time over time, well, great. Now, you know, a lot of things, but you don't know anything really well. Mm. And you become like, yeah, sure, you're useful because you can pick up and do anything somebody asks, but you can only do it to a beginner's level. And so I really got stuck in that of like, it has like try everything and see what fits, but it became a habit to the point where I was never do, I wasn't diving into anything deep enough to be super valuable to anybody. Mm. Yeah. So I think as far as like worst advice goes, that's got to like, that's just a phrase I think that has to get rid of it. It's like, yeah, you like try stuff. You have to know what you like, sure. right? but if you find something you like, don't give up on it when it becomes hard. Like you have, like you have to take the time because like, you're going to hit a plateau at some point that learning curve is going to, you know, like taper off and you really got to get through like the mud before you start to get really good at it again. And there's like that, it's a, it's like a chasm you have to gap and like, just like get through it before it becomes valuable. And if you don't do that with anything, you're going to be like perpetually screwed. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's, that's probably pretty bad advice to somebody of like, do everything, don't get very good at anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I would probably have more if I deeply think about it, but that was first to the head. So it was probably, no, that was, that was great. I've never heard that before, <laughs> but that's a really solid point. I've never thought of it that way. Appreciate it. Um, man, best advice I ever got. I actually just wrote a LinkedIn post about this the other day and it's like, I say best advice and I don't know it's be even made the biggest impact on my life, but it's the thing I think about the most consistently that's like provided a positive influence on me. Um, hmm. And it was like, yeah, people will very remember, people will very rarely remember what you say to them, but they'll always remember how they felt in your presence. Right. So that like, comes from the standpoint of like, you don't have to be the smartest in the room to be the most valuable. Mm. Right. If you can just like show up and by just being there, you can make the space a better place. It's like, everybody's going to want you on their team. Um, I don't know if you saw the Simon Sinek thing, but they talk about like, um, the skill trust graph with like, mm. yeah. skills. and so it's like, you want the highest trusted guys. You don't always want the most skilled, but I think the same goes for business and taking trust out of the equation, but like, like likeliness, right? Like how much are you actually going to enjoy being around that person? And even if they have, no skill 
Well, great. That's something you can teach them, but you have to enjoy working with them. Right. And so I think that was one of the things. And I always tell the story um, of like, the reason I got that advice is I started teaching the adjunct class. Mm. Um, Very, very extroverted person. I love people, talk to them all day long. Public speaking scares the shit out of me. <laughs> like, I, I don't know what it is. So like, I put a, like a perfection cap on public speaking of like, I had to have everything prepped. It's not as natural. We're not having a conversation. It's just me riffing. Right. Um, so there's like no direction. And when I started teaching this class, I went in on day one and I like literally froze. I got through like the syllabus and I was just like, I can't do this. I teach it basically like ended class early, had to go back 48 hours later. And I was like, just tripping about it. I was like, I have, I can't teach this semester. Um, and that was like the kind of thing that like got me through it legitimately of like, Oh, I don't have to be the most educated professor on this topic. I have to make this class very, very enjoyable for these students. Mm. Right. And if I can do that, then teaching and, you know, learning becomes really, really easy. And so it was like that kind of switch that I implemented in that class, but now take with me everywhere. Right. Like getting jobs, talking to people, trying to get on new clients. They don't have to believe that I'm the smartest, but they definitely better enjoy talking to me and learning from me more than they do my competitors. And that is a wrap for this episode of the Try, Fail, Learn podcast. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and review. We'll catch you next time. Oh,